So this video has been a whirlwind from start to finish. You've been keeping up with what's going on. First, there was a video from Steve at Gamers Nexus cutting deep into the Linus Media Group ethical and professional responsibilities. Uh, we were just going to report on serious concerns that we have with LTT and bring some awareness to these critical issues. A few hours after that video, Linus responded on the LTT forums with a very emotional take on the situation. Gamers Nexus then put out a news video picking apart Linus's response. The following morning, headed by the new CEO of Linus Media Group, Taryn Tong, they published a video indirectly responding to the key criticisms and issues made by Steve. I'm speaking today because of the recent community outcry demanding change. I'm here because I agree with the community. We do have a lot of work to do. To also add into the mix, just before that video went live, a former employee of Linus Media Group took to social media to speak about the hit on her mental health and inappropriate comments and a tox toxic atmosphere inside LMG. This comment wasn't addressed by the new CEO in the video, as the video had only appeared a short time later, but with everything else that's going on, it's important to highlight and we'll talk a bit about it here. In this video, which initially was going to be a deeper analysis of Steve's initial video, this video is still going to do that, but also tie in all of the new points that have come to light since. What's your minimum specification? So before getting into it, there will be some ground explanations and rules. Now I've been on social media the last few days trying to keep track of all the moving pieces. One of the first comments I got when I said I was making this video was from somebody who had never heard of me before and asked if I could introduce myself at the start along with my credentials. With that in mind, welcome to the Tech Potato channel. My name is Ian Cutris, and I spent 10 years as a CPU and senior editor for the website Anantech, covering consumer and enterprise PC hardware, as well as details regarding the semiconductor industry. In that time, I amassed over a billion views on my work, and some of it isn't that bad. I started this channel three or so years ago, with the aim to put a voice to a lot of my detailed analysis of the hardware and the industry. I do deep dives into new architectures, new science, things like quantum computing and machine learning hardware. I also, from time to time, interview industry legends like AMD CEO Lisa Su, Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger, chip wizards Jim Keller, Raj Kaduri, and amazingly fun and talented people like Intel's Ann Kelleher, IBM's Talia Gershon, AMD's Mike Clark, and the world record holders of, say, digits of Pi, like Google's Emma Iruka Iwao. YouTube, however, isn't my main job. My day-to-day -day is actually as an industry consultant and analyst. Companies pay me to help with technical detail, marketing vision, and in some cases, the actual wording of how things will be promoted. So, that means, can you trust me? Someone pointed out that Linus Media Group flew me out to the Linus Tech Expo, so how can I be trusted? Now, I'll be honest, the Linus Expo flight was less than 2% of my travel this year, and they offered to cover it. I currently run my own company, and usually if somebody offers me travel, then I accept with my only stipulation being no quid pro quo. Even then, during the show, I essentially outed some of the controversial business practices around defining sponsored content at Linus Media Group to be problematic, to Linus's face, using his own words, live on stage in front of over a thousand people. I would put that clip in here, but this video is going to be quite long anyway. That's perhaps for a different video where I analyze that presentation on its own. Aside from that time on stage, I think I've actually spoken to Steve more in the past year than I have to Linus. But again, can you trust me? If companies like AMD and Intel pay me for consultancy work, can you trust me? Whenever somebody tells, asks me that, I explicitly say no. I'm not here to be trusted. I'm here to present facts and offer analysis. The work itself should do the talking. I am simply the medium. I have experience, sure, and those that have known me a while may trust the analysis from my experience that I offer. But if you don't know me, then my advice is to simply to not trust me at all by default. Make your own conclusions from the data, and if there's parity, then perhaps we may find common ground. So another thing for this video is the ground rules. One of the reasons I started writing the script for this video is because the video from Steve at Gamers Nexus and his approach to explaining things came across as very odd. 
the ability to mask fact versus opinion, not following standard or expected investigative journalist reporting practices, and some of the extreme nitpicks involved. A lot of this, I believe, is simply due to the lack of understanding, and I want to fill in the gaps as best I can. A lot of it has to do with the go-between, a small company from a big company, which I'll get into. My initial comments on social media about the video started this script, which ended up longer than my master's thesis. A lot of people are going to think that this video is simply an attack on Steve and Gamers Nexus, or that I should be focusing more on Linus Media Group's glaring deficiencies highlighted by Steve. This video, my intention, is not meant to be an attack on Steve at all, but an analysis of the situation through the lens of the comments he has made. We will also cover what Linus Media Group has done and criticize, and that's the main part of this, as well as my thoughts on it as well. A number of you might think this is a defense of Linus Media Group, and no, I'm going to take them to the cleaners as well. But the how is ever the most important, and the words and evidence used have to be explicit, and I'll go into that. The second ground rule is the nature of this content. If I've learned anything from the feedback about this story is that for every dozen people, there are five dozen criticisms that I should be focusing on something else. There may be a part of this story for which you think is the most explicit and the specific point to focus on, or that that point really drives it home for you and is black and white. This video is going to tear down a lot of those presuppositions. I'll be focusing on many points throughout the whole story most of which should at least cover the one you are most passionate about. And for the topics that, for you, might be black and white, please don't be offended when I start picking them apart. There's a point to understanding that even the most serious, even the most egregious things that can happen to us happen in degrees. The reality is very rarely black and white. Third, and ground rules, is naming. I'm going to be very clear when I'm talking about Linus, the person, and Linus Media Group, the company, or Linus Tech Tips, the brand. I'll be very explicit with Steve, the person, and Gamers Nexus, the company, as well. The entities are different, and a, lo a, and a lot of what I've read online makes it read as if people assume they are the same. Steve is not on every Gamers Nexus email, just as Linus is not on every Linus Media Group email. Just like Lisa at AMD isn't on every email I send to AMD, though it would be amusing if that really did happen. In order to separate where the issues are, I'll be very explicit in my referring, because it's important where blame, if any, should lie. Now before you say that he was CEO, he should accept all of it, then you fall back into the black and white category that I've mentioned before. That doesn't let him off, but it ensures that a fundamental accuracy when we discuss all of this. So if you've made it this far into the intro, and yes, it is a long intro and you're still watching, there's also one more ground rule I'd like to put in here. A lot of this video, and I mean a lot of it, is going to go into explicit nuances and the interpretation of different words. I'm literally going to go into the differences between phrases like A can do X thanks to B, compared to A can do X due to B, and what that means at a subconscious level. If you enjoy that level of anal detail, then this is a video for you. A lot of you are going to think I'm being overly needling, but in order to get some of these psychoanalytic depths, this is what I have to do. On top of that, there are likely times where I'm going to come across as hypocritical. That will be one of my character flaws too. I'll hold my hands up and admit that. I'm not perfect either. I'm not trying to portray myself as perfect, but please feel free to call out these points in the comments but please keep the discourse respectful about anyone who you talk about. And with that, let's begin with our sponsor, which is me. I hope you can take something away from this. So I was going to make this video to follow the timeline of Steve's video, but since then, and with some of the issues, I'm going to drag a couple of the key points out in the open first. To start, the Billet Labs debacle. This is really two stories in one, a bad review and an auction. Any way you cut it, Linus Media Group shats the bed here. Some of that is at the feet of Linus, and much of it is obvious, and a lot of it ends up in the hands of other LMG employees as well. So rather than go into explicitly what Steve has said here in detail, as I might do in most of the topics in this video, I'll go through the whole way in which Billet Labs incident was handled and how it's handled quite poorly. 
Overall, it was a shit show, for multiple reasons, but I want to take the different aspects of it in turn for individual commentary. To start with, let's go over the facts. And let's start with the review itself. In the review, Billet Labs provided a prototype 3090Ti water monoblock to Linus Media Group for testing and review. This water block, as Steve points out, is likely individually worth thousands, but with an opportunity cost and IP that is immeasurable to the small two-person startup it came from. In the Linus Tech Tips video, it becomes apparent that the second host accidentally picked up a 4090 from the shelf. Either he didn't, want, he didn't see a 3090 Ti on the shelf, or, and just didn't want to delay filming, we're not sure. But only halfway through filming, was it showcased that it wouldn't fit properly, and it was recognized that it wasn't the right card for the monoblock. The video states that Billet Labs responded to using a 4090 that while it might work, it wasn't officially tested and they surged ahead. It turns out later, and whether Linus knew about it or not, that Billet Labs had actually provided a known fitting 3090Ti that the video production wasn't given for the filming. Ultimately, the video gave the product a big thumbs down because it didn't look like it worked properly with that 4090 graphics card. Linus later stated in a response to video, that while they could have reshot with a 3090Ti, as he felt that given the supposed similarity of the GPUs, it should have worked better, and the estimated end price of the cooler at $800 made it out of reach, and thus the fact that the 4090 didn't work didn't matter, and it wasn't worth the extra time to shoot. He stated that he felt that the additional time and effort, quoting up to $500 of person time, wasn't worth the payoff. It wasn't stated if this was a reshoot while still filming, or reshoot after the first filming, as you could argue the costs of each are different, and I'll get more into that later. Linus then stated that the second host in the video put the idea to retest, but Linus blocked it. Ultimately, this video wasn't really meant to be a review, but an unpaid showcase of something extreme, akin to the holy shit series of content Linus Media Group is known to produce. It was meant to be entertainment with some testing, even though it ended up crapping on the product. There are plenty of times Linus Media Group has crapped on a product for it only to have its best sales week ever. A $30 uh, set of headphones comes to mind. This being a startup has riled a lot of people. Billet Labs being a startup has riled a lot of people. Basically dumping on years of work for a small startup and they didn't even give it a fair shot. Now I don't have an issue with LMG dumping on something, even from a startup. However, I do agree that the dump has to be a result of fair testing even if the price is outlandish. In this case, a full retest was warranted for sure. Yvonne, Linus's wife and CFO, has stated in the latest Linus Media Group video that Linus incorrectly blocked the filming and retesting. She stated that the cost of retesting shouldn't matter if the content is wrong, which is the right approach. I can assure you that I've read the criticisms that we weren't willing to spend $500 to test a product, and as the one that manages the finance, I can tell you that couldn't be further from the truth. Linus made a clear and egregious judgment error regarding retesting a product he felt was impractical. That was wrong, and I've told him so. Billet Labs then requested twice for the prototype and the GPU to be returned. Neither were returned. So here we move to the auction, and here's where it gets very shitty. At the LTX Expo 2023 event in Vancouver, one of the stalls in the corner of the room was a silent auction area with a number of items as seen in previous Linus Media Group videos. These include the original Wanox server, the Zenvo Z1 Prison smartphone, the LMG Diamond play button case, the Baby Hot Wheels case, a massive custom-built PC, and the Billet Labs monoblock. Rules of the silent auction is that you put your name, email, and a price, and whoever has the highest price at the end of the event gets to buy the thing. All proceeds in this case went to charity. Now, I can either go straight to the heat or explain the process here. I'll actually start with the process. I am more confident than not that Linus was not personally involved in this auction or with any communication with Billet Labs up to this point. It was very likely, and I'm happy to be proved wrong on this, that the engagement with Billet was likely through the sales team or the writing team, and the video was greenlit, and the first time Linus knew about Billet was when it came time to film or at script review. After that, the person in contact with Billet would have remained in contact. When it comes to deciding what goes to that auction, there would have been someone to which that task was assigned. It was their job to find items for auction, along with the big ticket items. 
and all of the small sundry items. Colton, in the latest Linus Media Group video, has confirmed that to be the case. I can fully imagine that person going through previous videos and assuming that if they still have the hardware, then, then it is Linus Media Groups, and as a result, never checked with whose video it was whether the hardware was still needed. Anyone who then saw the silo auction stand would have assumed it was approved. I don't know if Linus ever visited the auction stands during the event, and it was in the far corner, or even if he knew about the back and forth with Billet to this point. Of course, the auction ends, the exchange happens, and the next anyone thinks about it is when Billet still isn't getting the hardware back, and the person on that email exchange can no longer find it in the warehouse, and a public statement is made. To make matters worse, after the fact, an LMG employee emails all the winners of the auctions, asking for names and addresses as if they had lost the list of winners. Colton stated that the list was misplaced and that the email was in error. Now, based on this flow, you can clearly see a fuck ton of massive red beacons. The person who didn't send it back in time, the person in charge of the auction, not double checking if they could auction it. No one doing due diligence before, during, or after. It actually came to my attention that a second item, the Hot Wheels case, was also erroneously auctioned. The content creator that supplied it to Linus Media Group, who was actually at the expo, stated that he actually had preferred if they'd given it back to him. I don't know whether if that ever escalated beyond a personal conversation, however. Now, as you can imagine, if you're Billet, here's a company that's reviewed your product incorrectly, said it's useless, and then sold or auctioned, though the exact word makes little difference at the end of the day, your one and only prototype. I'm sure here, laws were broken. Then we get into the response. I'll limit this to just the Billet Labs incident for now, but Linus responded on the forum about 3 hours 30 after Gamers Nexus posted their video. In that post, with other comments, Linus stated that they'd reached out to Billet and basically told them to give them a dollar figure to make it right, or as other people may have stated, to make it go away. Linus stated that after they gave a number, they'd be paying it and consider the matter closed. Billet Labs responded stating that this was not the chain of events, that in an email they had stated the value of the block of, of the, the value of the block as a prototype but no direct email exchange about returning the prototype or financial conversation had actually taken place. This has enraged a lot of people. In a follow-up commentary, Gamers Nexus has found that the number Billet Labs provided is actually from an older email, and since the debacle, no actual increased dollar amount has been stated. This also, this also happened at the time in the UK at midnight to make things a lot more complex. Since that point, Billet Labs has posted on Reddit an overview of the situation. Linus Media Group had contacted them stating they could buy the monoblock back from the auction buyer, but Billet has refused, asking for the previously stated monetary value instead. Their reasoning is that it had already started building a replacement, and there was no guarantee that the block still worked or had all the custom fittings given how many hands it had been through, and that it wasn't currently in the hands of uh, Linus Media Group, so if the monetary value provided, the matter was considered closed. They also stated that even if they'd get the block back, they were skeptical that they could get it up and running in good time compared to simply building a new one. From a legal perspective, I can only assume that Linus Media Group and Billet will have docu documentation drawn up to remove any liability from Linus Media Group after the money is paid. That's the practical thing to do. Personally, I think Linus Media Group should still get the block back and send it to Billet, as well as pay the value. Even if Billet can't use it, at least it's with them, and they can be rest assured it's with them. Linus's comments in the WAN show and then on the forum did not help one bit. Yes, he was clearly emotional, but that does not excuse him. The outrage this has made is easily understandable, and there are plenty of you that want to see LMG write a sincere apology, especially how Linus personally doubled down on the negative review of the product. However, for the loss of that, for a lot of the audience here, it seems that that is not enough. Not enough for the financial conversation, and for Billet to be happy with the end result, or at least as happy as they can be. It's very clear that a portion of the audience wants Linus to be publicly shamed at this point, to have a video with his tail between his legs and shuffle awkwardly as people throw tomatoes at him or something. While the auction wasn't Linus's fault, it was Linus Media Group's fault. It's shitty. The whole Billet Labs saga from start to end. Now the question is, is there an end? A talking point here that's been brought up would it have been the same if they'd sold an NVIDIA prototype or similar? Well, for a start, Linus Media Group's relationship with NVIDIA has been broken for a long time, but that's not the point here. 
This sort of thing would have only have happened with a small startup item that Linus wasn't involved with. Billet Labs is super small, and as a result, it wouldn't need the engagement of the senior staff like an NVIDIA or AMD engagement would have. Having been in this reviewing community for a while, I can categorically say that reviewers of yesteryear did indeed sell off old samples. Some of that was actually to pay for bills, because journalism simply doesn't pay these days, or simply to recoup the time for review. In almost all circumstances, hardware you get for review is never yours. It's on loan, and sometimes that loan is returned. For others, it's usually a more long-term loan arrangement. But if that sample ever ends up on the open market and gets RMA'd, it will get back to you, and that's not a conversation you want to have. I remember years and years ago, I called out Linus for selling a Samsung phone they'd got in for review, only a month or so after it was reviewed. This is when the Linus Tech Tips website had a section to buy old hardware. Though this is different, and you know, charity auction, whether you want to auction sales is different, and at this point Linus does not need to sell samples to drive cash. The chain of quality assurance in this case was non-existent. The response has been gut-wrenching. Is it endemic to Linus Media Group as a whole? In isolation, no. The sale of samples is not. You can, you can continue to argue that the rush, review rushing is endemic, however. For what it's worth, I've reached out to Billet Labs, as they are not too far from my offices. I requested, out of the blue, an opportunity to visit, first to record a video about them, and only if they wanted to comment on the saga. Unfortunately, I, as I only had the following day to do so, and my next couple of weeks are booked, I didn't hear a reply. That's understandable, they're probably going through a lot of messages, and bigger creators like Jay and Steve want to get involved, so I doubt they even saw my message. I'm not going to be top of that list, but if they do reach out, I will follow up. So next up on things to address immediately, I want to talk about the social media posts made by a former Linus Media Group employee, Madison, that were posted in the middle of all this. Now as a forewarning, None of this audience should go harassing anyone in this video, especially Madison. For context, Madison posted this at 11pm to midnight in Vancouver time, and the final Linus Media Group video available on Floatplane at 3am and then Vancouver time and then 4am on YouTube. So for anyone complaining that Linus Media Group hasn't addressed these comments in that video or directly, will have to wait. And they have since published an official statement on Twitter about this. The timing on it wouldn't have worked for a response, in, in the original video, but given the severe nature of the tweets made, I feel it prudent to mention it here, as well as present the audience with a trigger warning as some of this content may be unsuitable. Madison Reeve was employed by Linus Media Group up until two years ago as their social media coordinator. At the time, it would appear that she was the sole person employed in this role, especially to post, in her words, in a day, three tweets, two Instagram posts, and two TikToks, which doesn't seem bad. But on top of this were the requirements to plan, film, edit, and post two float plane exclusives per week, managing all the people involved to do that, as well as manage, plan, schedule, get approval, and execute all sponsored content on socials that weren't YouTube. Eventually, she made her way into more main channel content as well. It's what I would call the job of a social media team, not on the feet of one person. She quit Linus Media Group as a result, in her words, of the ruining of her mental health. The tweet thread goes into more detail, explicitly showcasing what can only be described as harassment, bullying, belittling, condescension, bait and switch rules, inappropriate sexual discussions, and inappropriate sexual contact. She also details self-harm in order to have sick days that she was told off for taking. Whichever way you slice it, what she recalls is absolutely hor horrifying and shouldn't be wished upon anyone. It paints an explicit picture from peers to management of a toxic workplace with teams of badly managed individuals. Not only that, the words describe a severe mismanagement in hiring procedure, such as bait and switch, and the day-to-day -day fear of other employees and management due to their actions or words, on top of a lack of any formative HR acting on addressing specific employee concerns. The detailing of certain events makes me shudder just to read them. Our thoughts should go out to Madison and hope that by putting words down at least, in some part, a weight is lifted from her. Now to address some of the bad takes that this has brought out from the audience. Some of you are fucking idiots. First, to the people who say, why now? Why in the middle of this? All I have to say is, does it fucking matter? At all. When you're small and the other party's big, there's always a fear of speaking out. 
Fear can be petrifying, literally, like rigid in place. You come out when you are feel comfortable and when you're ready to do so. In this instance, it happened in the middle of all what's happening with Linus Media Group, and there's less chance of her getting death threats. And the Linus Media Group audience has a history of giving death threats. Given, yeah, given, I've re literally written in my script, given some of Linus Media Group's audience, that's a valid concern. If you still think the timing is fishy, just be glad you've never been in a situation like this. Jesus Christ. Second, to those asking why we believe her, and shouldn't we hear both sides first with that before even addressing the issue? First of all, you are a fucking problem. If someone is being attacked by a lion, you don't first ask the lion for their side of the story. You ensure the person who was being attacked is safe and well. If it's taken someone this long to speak up, being paralyzed for the fear that long, or for being afraid of the consequences, it is an extortionate mental toll. If there's going to be a both sides to this, I fully expect it to happen behind closed doors, either legally or not, in either direction, and only the remedy to be made public. So while writing this script, Linus Media Group has confirmed to The Verge and then posted on social media that they are taking Madison's allegations seriously. Along with updating their existing internal systems, an external third-party investigator is being used to look into the allegations. The tweet says that they are committed to publishing the findings and implementing corrective actions. While this is a one of the more positive ways to address an issue like this, there is a potential for those findings to be redacted, especially if there are any criminal implications. There has also been leaked audio of the post-Madison leaving meeting at Linus Media Group about HR issues, headed up by Linus and Yvonne. The audio showcased boilerplate company protection wording, however, some of it, I feel, was egregiously out of line. Upper management clearly knew about the reasons why she left, though perhaps not the complete end-to-end -end as Madison saw it, but in some part, and handled it more akin to drama than sexual, allegation, sexual assault allegations and bullying in the workplace. Regardless of whether it's the truth or not, these things should be taken way more seriously than they were. Linus Media Group is no longer several guys working out of a house in Lanley, and by these words it easily comes across that some of them haven't grown out of that mindset. The growing pains of a company like Linus Media Group are no more obvious than in this singular moment, because this matters more than any erroneous benchmark or anything else I'll speak about today. By that measure, I'll admit this could have been the first topic in this video, but it should be your biggest takeaway. So with those two topics, let's move on to covering Steve from Gamers Nexus's video. I highly recommend that if you haven't watched it yet, you should. And then the Linus Media Group response. Links will be provided in the description below. As I mentioned earlier, the original purpose of this video was to go through and shed some light on a lot of Steve's comments especially with my knowledge of large organizations and Linus Media Group structure, as well as his use of very specific wording for certain things, and the psychological effect of putting words and thoughts in a particular way. I'll be critiquing both Steve's content and the Linus Media Group story a fair bit, and I can already foresee a lot of you might perceive this as attacking Steve, or giving Linus a free ride, as perhaps I apply different standards to each. That's not the intended case. I'm merely holding them both to their respective bars of ethics and professionalism. Steve holds himself to a much higher bar than most, and so that's going to be the angle I'm going to probe going through his content. Most of the rest of this video will follow the same timestamps as the Gamers Nexus video. To start, the intro. Steve calls out Linus Media Group, Linus Tech Tips Linus, for several things, some of which we've discussed already. It starts with a clip of Linus Media Group's labs, LTT Labs, an employee stating how Labs is unique, when right now they aren't. This is a point that Steve from Hardware Unboxed also took issue with a week ago. Gamers Nexus have said that they said nothing at the time, but states that the Linus Media Group Labs employee is inaccurate, and we'll get into how Linus Media Group doesn't retest every video. However, in Linus Media Group's updated uh, response, Gary from Labs clarifies it they actually retest for every project, while it may not be every video. Steve then points out Gamers Nexus isn't explicitly mentioned on the WAN show response to that clip as if to drive home the point that Linus isn't being explicit enough in addressing these things. Steve then interprets personal relationships with vendors as a point of contention in a very mocking tone, as if his way is the only way, but we'll get to that. That's the intro and then on to the main video. 
we start off with Steve going through an overview of his video. So aside from the Linus Media Group Labs employee issue, which Steve says is not the most important aspect of the video, which makes me wonder why he chose it to cover explicitly in, the, in that first intro, the issue is more about the self-imposed deadlines of content leading to rushed reviews and erroneous data. This conflicts with Linus's external quote on maintaining accuracy and having data-driven reviews at Linus Media Group. Steve explicitly states that the Gamers Nexus video about this is not monetized, that this is likely to eliminate any comments that he's profiting off the drama financially. But it's hard not to miss the additional exposure to his channel and the uplift the algorithm will provide from it. He is getting a benefit from this channel, even if it's not a financial one initially. If Steve truly want to, wanted to exculpate himself from gaining from this content, one option would be to put it on a new channel. Steve says, we were just going to report on serious concerns we have with Linus Tech Tips and bring some awareness to these critical issues. We've been thinking on this for a few months now. Steve points out the main highlights of his video. It spans from raw data that potentially misleads consumers, even if unintentional, ethical concerns and corporate connections, especially in this case, Billet Labs, ethical concerns regarding Linus Tech Tips' recent review of the Pornish Stormbreaker mouse, and a pseudo-correction where LMG fails to take ownership of the issue and blames the product. Steve then goes into marketing versus reviews versus entertainment. He states that reviews have a different technical level of detail due to the way reviews are seen by, this, by an audience. However, this isn't new, even for video. However, depend, whatever amount of technical detail you put into review can differ based on how detailed you want the video to be. There's a section of this industry called the lifestyle press who reviews things like watches or MacBooks. Are they deta detailing the intricate mechanism inside or going into detail about the microarchitecture or gaming performance? No. They have different motives. It's important to know which motive the publication, independent or not, has, and whether that changes content to content, video to video. So first we get into this first big topic of C's video, rushing. Steve states that Linus Media Group is rushing content out of the door, causing these issues with accuracy, and that the employees agree. The video then cuts in to several video comments from employees from the what it's like to work for Linus video. Employers say, that the fast neck pace has a hit on data, data accuracy or collection. And then Steves points out that the issue with ethics when posting knowingly erroneous data. Linus even says that in the video it's all go, go, go and doesn't address the concern of speed. Across five channels, Linus Media Group publishes 25 videos a week. However, of those, three are clips, two are float plane exclusives, four are shorts, and one is a live stream. So realistically, what we're actually looking at here is 15 full length proper videos across five channels, 15 videos that do end up having that high level of quality. Now, yes, employees can be overworked. You'll struggle to find an employee who wouldn't rejoice working at a more relaxed pace. People like Steve from Hardware Unboxed states that he works 16 hours a day, seven days a week, and he likes it. Linus Media Group's approach is to continually pump out content, partly for growth and revenue reasons, and growth, which has a knock-on effect to growth and revenue. For context here, Linus Tech Tips grows at just under 100,000 subscribers a month with six videos a week on the main channel, one of which is a live stream. We'll get into some of the issues about data collection and more time to film when errors observed and the costs involved later on. But I should point out that Steve states in this part of the video that though they are rushing, and this rushing is causing significant and frequent testing errors, but is clouding the ethical judgment. It's important to note here that at this point in the video, this would historically be inferred as Steve's opinion, and he's drawing correlation and not causation here. He does this multiple times in his video, seemingly interjecting his opinion before providing the data. And I'll highlight the ones that I find. I've learned over the years of writing, when somebody is reading a script and using specific wording, either knowingly or unknowingly, they can draw an opinion as if it was a defined conclusion. Steve does this incredibly well and it goes unnoticed a lot of time, again, in my opinion. You may not think that way with what he says, simply because it's an obfuscation, but it is done incredibly well. I'm going off my experience and my analysis of his wording in previous content, as well as on this specific point. I'm of the expectation that any objective analytical piece should start with defining the problem, presenting the data, explaining the data, and then offering up an opinion, kind of like a research paper. 
Steve's videos tend to do the reverse, or at least sprinkle the opinion throughout. Again, this is from my perspective of what I've seen. Maybe it's for engagement, but usually this was considered historically an egregious overstepping of the journalist's role compared to, say, an opinion com columnist. So here we move into the second section of Steve's video, the accuracy and data to mislead. Steve states that on the back of the billet video at the beginning, that Linus sometimes publishes known bad or known incorrectly acquired data, which is different from a mistake. Here we have two buckets for pot any potential erroneous data. So known bad or known inaccurately acquired data or mistakes. The word Steve uses here is sometimes as a plural. I'll state that this part of the video He's presenting a conclusion, but has only offered up one piece of evidence. Because he hasn't established any continual issue, I'm going to have to point it out here. He may have the data on, but the time for that conclusive remark is later. He does showcase that Linus knew, at least at the end of filming with Billet, that the wrong piece of hardware was used. This was in fact a mistake by the person sending out the video, as I mentioned before, grabbing the wrong video card, and it turns out they were sent one by Billet themselves. Linus's immediate justification for not retesting uh, was that the GPUs were, too, were not too dissimilar, although Steve disagrees about this based on video card tolerances. But Linus also argues that the hardware was over $800, uh, the monoblock would cost over $800, which no one informed would buy at that price. Linus has since backtracked on this point, but only after doubling down in the forums. I'd rather see the data with the GPU intended, which would mean refilming. Alex in the video did put pressure on Linus to retest, but Linus declined. Linus is very driven, and so a quality assurance in this position would, have to, would be to stop him, be stronger willed than him, and say, yes, we're doing it again. On this topic, I broadly agree with Steve. Steve states that the publishing of known bad data calls into question the motivation of the corporation. Because yes, if I were to jump to a conclusion, I think you're suggesting that every evil corp with known bad data has a bylaw that simply says do evil or something similar. I'm annoyed because I find this statement broadly sweeping, generalized, non-specific, and a somewhat simplification to the obliviousness of, of what a content production pipeline for Linus Media Group is. Should Steve be cognizant here? Absolutely. Does it matter? I'd say yes for someone in Steve's position to say what he has, which again falls in this instance under opinion. Steve highlights the arbitrarily self-imposed deadlines that Linus Media Group has and its fast-paced schedule. Steve states that this ends up with the misleading consumers and at some point it is no longer an unintentional mistake to mislead with known shortcuts that reduce accuracy. I also have issues with this because it relates to business vision and maintenance. If the company has predicted growth, any company, and it revolves around meeting targets, then you go to meet those targets or KPIs, key performance indicators. In this instance, Steve is highlighting a very measurable metric, the publishing schedule, which, as I mentioned earlier, is 15 full-length videos and the rest are shorts or live shows. If the growth of the group under new CEO Terran is to continue on the same path, then there will also be a schedule. And a relevant question here is if that schedule stays the same or changes. Speed and quality are a knob you can slide from one side to the other. To the point now where a lot of bulk written media are now simply speeded with little or no benchmarks. If Steve is aligning with the speed of content with the unintentional mistake to lead, that's a claim he fails to explicitly showcase in this video, as we'll go into further. He cites issues leading up the path, but by any measure of connecting dots end to end, he does not uh, do the final connection, which ultimately means, again, we fall back on Steve showcasing opinion before we hear evidence, but presenting it as fact. This is Steve applying his own logic, kind of which we all do, but to a sequence of events and coming to a conclusion presenting to millions of viewers. This view is one that you may also share. But following a logic trail is different to meeting a burden of proof. It is not explicitly the topic at hand that annoys me about this. I mean, it still annoys me. I like good data, but it's this way of arbitrary following logic and presenting opinion before presenting evidence that really busts my balls as somebody who's actually done investigative journalism. So the next section of video is drama and risk. Steve highlights that people will call his video drama. However, despite that, he feels that the content is a necessary conversation worth having. In terms of the content, I agree. Although it should be taken in the context of the fact that personal individual standards 
are not the same as industry standards. To call out people for calling it drama is a form of gatekeeping, which I find is pretty horrendous. Part of it here, explicitly with Linus Media Group, is understanding the Linus Media Group model. Some of it is reviews, some of it is showcases, and some of it is weird shit. And then the question becomes whether the audience can actually tell the difference. In a recent panel about sponsored reviews that Linus and I were both on, I literally called him out on this, stating that the audience typically doesn't register a difference, and especially when it comes to sponsorships, but more on that later. When Steve says about calling it drama, I don't think he means that this way when he says accuracy and ethics is a conversation worth having, but I think it's absolutely a key point into defining who we are and what we are as an industry or individuals within this industry. Ultimately, part of the shit show that Linus Media Group is in is because they're trying to do it all. The fact that the labs isn't up to speed yet, and the labs team trying to showcase Linus Media Group as a bastion of raw data collection, goes to show that Linus Media Group really has multiple personalities right now, some of which will take time to evolve. But in the meantime, this has led to a lot of issues. A lot of people have highlighted that Linus Media Group has growing pains, maintaining the small independent media breakneck speed of doing it all for too long, and it has effective quality. But then Steve states that if anyone starts calling it drama as some sort of catch-all platitude to discourage, then that's, they're calling it drama because they're uncomfortable with the story. Now with this, I vehemently disagree and find it obnoxious that Steve is already presupposing your audience, his, or his audience's reaction. More than that, he's telling the audience what to think. That's an egregious break of trust that you should endure with your audience, especially this early on in the video. And I find it galling Steve would suggest such a thing. I'm of the opinion that the audience should come to their own conclusion, or at least stick a comment like this at the end as opinion and state it as such. Steve also says that the topic makes him uncomfortable. It's fine to state how you're feeling, but please don't tell your, you shouldn't really be telling your audience how to feel, even if they disagree with you, unless you're telling them to actually take a hike. I will state that at this point in the video, Steve says I haven't enjoyed the process of it, but it feels like something we desperately needed to do, otherwise we wouldn't be doing it. It's worth noting that when Steve says, I haven't enjoyed the process, he's smiling quite heavily. Now some people say Steve is a nervous smiler, and yeah, I get that, I understand that. However, that's simply not the case. You can watch the clip for yourself. I haven't enjoyed the process of it. What will be interesting to hear here is Steve's bar for this sort of thing. Everyone has their own bar when it comes down to accuracy or completeness of analysis. It's clear that Steve's bar to himself is quite high, and Linus Media Group's bar to Steve is low and has been dipping. Is there a universal bar we should set for everyone? No. Are there minimum standards we should be expecting from people who say we're doing X? Maybe. Talking point here is does the fact that Linus Media Group puts out erroneous content hurt gamers nexus in any way? And to a certain extent, from my perspective, no, it doesn't hurt Gamers Nexus. Steve tries to address this at the end of the video, which I'll cover there, but I think has a bad take. From my perspective, erroneous Linus Media Group content does not hurt the content that Gamers Nexus makes at any rate. When an outlet is obviously wrong, that damage, damage occurs to the brand. We're all kind of in our own little silos here with the content that we produce. What's not siloed is the audience, which means Steve is doing this as a way of educating the audience. That's what he wants to do. Steve's intent here is to showcase the issues with Linus Media Group rather than to promote his own positive take. But there will be some inference on that, as, some, as only someone who holds themselves to the highest standards would create this sort of content. And by contrast, that, you know, that applies to me as well with this video. As a result, I will be more confident than not that Steve and Gamers Nexus see this as a public service announcement, as he says he is bringing attention to it. There's a part of that that makes me feel a bit uneasy calling it that way, given that he's calling out one specific individual rather than looking at the industry as a whole, like a proper public service announcement would do. But that's his prerogative, and it's okay to have different opinions about stuff like that. The danger on doing individualized public service announcements like this would be any egotistical influence that might result, leading to an affirmation that this sort of content should be a staple for the future. I say that applying it to myself and my content more than anyone. Steve says it's not drama to simply talk about errors and factual testing issues and to bring light the issues so that Linus Media Group can rectify them. In general, I'd, I'd agree about topics from a generalized process, 
but I disagree with the process in this instance. The story Gamers Nexus provides is one specifically about Linus Media Group, which changes the nature of such a topic. For example, one part of ethical investigative journalism is, unless it's uncovering an explicit crime or break of the law, reaching out to get a formal response in advance. Gamers Nexus did it with principled technologies, and that blew up. Gamers Nexus did it with Newegg, and that blew up. Somehow, those companies got special treatment, but Linus Media Group did not. This isn't me sticking up for Linus Media Group here, but I'd be interested to hear the reason for the disparity. Steve, in his update video, explicitly states he doesn't have to ask for permission, but that's not the point here. Reaching out to Linus Media Group wouldn't stop you from posting your video, just like it didn't stop you posting uh, him posting the Principal Technologies or Newegg videos. The precedent set for the last 20 years of tech journalism and 100 plus years of investigative journalism is that you at least reach out. By not doing the basic due diligence in this instance, one could, in my opinion, presume that it's on the side of drama to do it in this format. However, I will relinquish that you are free to present your concerns as you see fit, as I am doing mine. I will take note that I've been contacted by people in the media who have expressed this as a serious concern in Steve's report. I'm not just talking about one person. I know for a lot of you, it seems for Steve, that this is the most minor of minor things. I told you this video that I'm going to be anal about specifics, and this is a specific CERN that other people in the industry have with this sort of content. Some of you will wonder if I reached out to either team before this video recorded. I did not, simply to emphasize this point. However, having mentioned that I was doing a video on social, I did receive contact from Linus Media Group last minute, who did offer to respond to any specific concern. For the sake of equilibrium to both sides, I might, not, I might post any responses from either side in a different piece of content rather than here. Steve says that Gamers Nexus are approaching this as objectively as possible. Now I'll refer to my previous comments, about, especially about Steve's videos. While perhaps not obvious to the casual viewer, he does interject subjective opinion, consciously or subconsciously, all the time. If I were to pick apart most of Gamers Nexus investigative analysis, this would be the most frequent element on my list. But this becomes from my experience in the topic, as well as a background in scientific publishing where, uh, where order and details matter. I know that for a lot of audience that responded to me on social as I was writing this, especially those that were pro Gamers Nexus by context, feel that there's no objective bar higher than Steve. Than Steve. Formally, from an analytical linguistic perspective, I disagree simply based on my analysis of his wording and structure. I know a lot of it is objective, but it's the subjective inserts that distort the potentially internally consistent narrative. And we'll go into examples here. Next section of Steve's video goes into the breakdown of Linus Media Group. Steve goes through the fact that Linus Media Group is 120 people and had a recent acquisition purchase offer of over $100 million and highlights that re Linus recently stepped down as CEO in favor of a former Corsair executive who also works with Linus at NCIX. This is Taron Tong. I've met him and he seems calm and collected for what it's worth. Steve then highlights that the person running the labs is a former marketing director of ASUS. Now this is something I do have an issue with. Steve says he wants to present this as objectively as possible, but he highlights Gary Key, the head of labs with a massive disservice. If you are not aware, the head of LTT labs is Gary Key who has been in that position for about a year now. He was formerly a senior directing mar director of marketing for ASUS USA for 12 years, although he wasn't in the top five people in charge of ASUS USA for what it's worth. The reason why I bring it up is the disservice here is that Steve portrays Gary as a marketer first. Gary's history is that he actually had my old job back at Anantech before he joined ASUS, and he only really joined ASUS because Anantech didn't pay enough. At Anantech, he was in charge of all motherboard testing, and motherboards are one of the hardest things to test in the industry. He set standards, he affected change, he laid several foundations that reviewers lean on today, consciously or not. To derate him as some senior director without highlighting his benchmarking experience is a massive, massive oversight, and that also highlights a very specific narrative here. Perhaps it doesn't change the outcome, but it's definitely a twist of the knife for sure. Steve then states, in the same sentence, that ASUS was the main title sponsor for the LTX event. 
The fact that this is a run-on sentence brings about the implication that ASUS was only the title sponsor because Gary had a say in it. The link isn't explicitly stated, but the pacing of the wording leads to that being my initial takeaway of that sentence. One of the key elements to doing any investigative journalism like this is to identify how your pacing and wording will be interpreted in advance. Before people claim I'm holding Gamers Nexus to a higher bar than Linus Media Group here, I'd argue I'm correlating how they set their own bars and I'll move in that context. Steve then states, also in the same sentence, that ASUS was the title sponsor of LTX following what we believe to be a soft-handed handling of ASUS's board and RMA issues. Again, this is another interpreted reason for ASUS being the title sponsor of the expo. If that wasn't what Steve meant explicitly, then I'm at a loss for words why this was even brought up in the context of the ASUS guy running the lab's comments at all. Either these are all interlinked phrases, or you're exclaiming a bunch of non sequiturs in a runoff sentence with unintended consequences. This is what this is aside from whether Steve believes ASUS got an easy ride from Linus Media Group, but there's no mentioning of AMD, who also sponsored the expo. Yet I don't believe Linus Media Group has hired an ex AMD employee to allow Steve to make that inference, but I bet you he would if he could. Again, this was made without evidence on Steve's part. I'm going to play that sentence for you in its entirety just so you can hear it for yourself. Its lab is led by a former marketing director for ASUS, which was recently the title sponsor for LTX following what we believe to be a rather soft-handed handling of ASUS's board and RMA issues by LTT. Next section of video is on errors, and Steve goes through about 13 minutes of segments where Linus Tech Tips has had errors in their content. Specifically here, GPUs, CPU coolers, power supplies, and then CPUs. I'm not going to go through each segment piece by piece, as they all drill down a similar narrative, inaccuracies and errors. What I would like to discuss here is the nature of errors. Steve categorizes them as intentionally publishing bad data or they are mistakes. But in this section, I'll discuss errors, deadlines, and how the review process differs from smaller organizations like Gamers Nexus to larger organizations like Linus Media Group or any big industry player. But to start, one thing we can all agree on is that no one is perfect. No one is error free, but it's more than that. After writing at Anantec for over a decade, I bet you could pull up any one of my reviews from those 10 years and find issues with it. Some of them were big errors, like the time I forgot to remove the plastic on the CPU cooler. And while testing it fine, performance wasn't as good as it should have been. Or the time I used an old overclocking regedit edit command to ensure consistency, and Microsoft patched it out and I hadn't realized and there was a performance de deficit. I had three or four big mayor culpas over my time there, requiring substantial rewrites and new testing entirely. I have also had big exposés that did really well, and you can find, probably find errors in those too. There were hundreds of corrections and edits that were put in place in my content before reviews and articles went live. There were hundreds of corrections and edits that were put in place after the content went live. I had the distinct benefit of being in a written medium where ed edits are easy. In video, edits are harder, and arguably you have a lot less time if you run to a deadline, for example a product embargo, in order to get it filmed and sent for editing and export. With written content, you can at least go to the last minute and make changes later, and we did that a lot. The tools for editing post-publishing provided by YouTube are, for video, woeful. So talking point here, does a YouTube channel need to meet an embargo? This actually came up on the same panel Lydis and I were on about sponsor reviews. My commentary, based on my observations, is that the larger the YouTube channel, the answer is no. These channels don't need to necessarily hit embargo. Because video is not a search engine optimization driven medium, I like to call it a thumbnail driven medium, like written media is, getting those search clicks isn't a priority. So you could be a day late, and we've seen people do that. But what of self-imposed deadlines? This is one of the critical aspects of Gamers Nexus's video. The company rushes to get content out the door, which ends up potentially low quality or inaccurate, or in the worst case, damning for a small startup. Here's where I'll get to cover some of the logistics when it comes to video production, both in smaller organizations like Gamers Nexus or larger ones like Linus Tech Tips. This is going to be as accurate to the best of my ability of my understanding as a content creator myself and working with big organizational clients. So the review process, what people actually might think it is. So a product arrives through the door, and as a long-term reviewer, you put it on a test bed, which eliminates all other variables. You then sit there for anywhere from two to 20 hours or more, running individual benchmarks 
noting that down the results, perhaps you start generating graphs, and then you start producing your article or script, taking B-roll as well. You may do B-roll first, or perhaps you can start writing that initial part before the hardware arrives. With a good script and a good set of data, if written, you might pass it to a non-technical editor, which may actually still be you, for uploading into the content system ready for publishing. With that good script and good set of data, for a video, you set up the filming area, recording your video, and then go to editing. You may have a video editor or not, it's unlikely they're technical, you're going to be relying on your script and B-roll suggestions to put it together. You may see the final outcome for final edits, or they may fall to another managing editor, but then we get it uploaded. Depending on any time constraints, any segment might be shortened. That's testing, writing, B-roll, filming, or editing. So what actually happens? There are two types of hardware reviewing segments, and I'll classify these as small team independents and medium or large team corporates. With a small team independent setup, usually less than eight people, often working together in the same room, there may be individual experts in that team, but more often than not, by being in the same room, the level of communication between everyone is immediate. The person benchmarking is right next to the writer, who is right next to the video editor, and smaller teams of tend to be full of technical people. If not engineers who live and breathe the stuff, then at least enthusiasts with experience or in the process of learning with everyone else around them. If there's a point of immediate concern, you just call Patrick because he sits opposite you. QA, quality assurance, is also an immediate process, whether it's a quick check on numbers or graphs or an exported video. For larger team corporate situations, as testing scales out to multiple people and output grows, there are two ways to build your review process teams. First, you can build teams of eight people that work on projects as a team, with very little external engagement with other teams. This has the same effect that a small team does. However, small teams can sometimes be at the whim if a person is down or, ser or serialized throughput ends up limited. Every team will need the same kit and the scale out solution becomes expensive very quickly. So this is rare. The second way of doing it for a large organization is to separate out the experts into groups. So all the people doing benchmarking get their own area where resources can be pooled, knowledge can be exchanged, and typically those people enjoy being around like-minded people. Same applies for the film crew, put them all in the same area. Same applies for the writers, all in the same area. Same applies for the video editors, all in the same area. Depending on how the organization operates, as a new project is brought in, Individuals from each team will be assigned to the project from who is available in the pool. There may be a group with, there may be an individual in the group with a specialty. For example, Greg might be the one who knows how to use the anechoic chamber, but who you are working with project to project might change. The other way of operating is by pipelining. A product comes in, a writer works with a benchmarker to discuss testing, then a benchmarker tests, the writer writes, and then the completed set gets passed to the next free host and film crew, then the next free video editor, who will all have to work off of notes, and perhaps there might be a meeting to catch up at speed, but there may not be. Some would argue that the small team setup for larger organizations just isn't scalable, hence why it moves to a more group-based dynamic where all of one particular type of person go into one place. All the big tech organizations run this larger pooled group dynamic. However, the larger organization route requires tighter management, explicit quality assurance, and the loss of technical knowledge further down the chain has to be compensated for, which ultimately is one of Steve's big comments here, on top of the need to go fast. Ultimately, tech media is a wide expanse, from publications that do zero benchmarks all the way to those that will test until the final minute of the deadline. The bigger the organization, at least in the way it operates in a big organization, the more checks will happen during the process. One of the procedures of evolving from a handful of people in a startup mentality to a large organization is scaling the checks and scaling the quality assurance. Sometimes you have to square up those checks and it's not simply a linear scale. However, with the wrong scaling, the technical details of the review or article may only be known to the initial person doing the writing or the testing, and is often relied upon that the facts about the item, either specifications or benchmark results, are correct by the time it hits filming stage. Tech media employs very few engineers mainly because engineers can earn 10x more working for a proper tech company, and journalism pay is terrible, and it's one of the reasons why, as an engineer, I left. So a lot of people in these positions, if not tech enthusiasts, 
are simply generic journalists, video editors, or film crew. The smaller teams, where most of the roles are held by one person or the whole team for that project is in the same room, there's a lot more scope for direct quality assurance as opposed to indirect quality assurance from a traditional editor-in-chief. Newspapers, for example, used to hire fact-checkers for this reason. Through the video, Steve takes apart the testing, a lot of which is valid on the way specific tests are done or methodology, but the way he nitpicks a bit on errors systemic to anyone, most of which I've done, is in my opinion excessive. This excessiveness applies to honest mistakes and having incorrect data like specifications, such as pointing out an asterisk needed when the host says a GPU is a 4070 Ti, but it's only a 4070. People make errors, and Steve continues to try and tie it in all to the LMG philosophy of speed versus accuracy. Ultimately, Steve is able to drive correlation, but no amount of correlation equates to causation, even if you believe it. One could point to some of the LMG employees wishing they had time to fix errors, by which I'll come to some of the additional issues that a scale video production would have. But bear in mind, one of the critiques here is that the output rate of videos, you know, they continuously say 25 a week, but it's 15 plus nine shorts on a live stream. And however, even if you slow down, there is on some level, you can't just go back to the small team model. And as a result, some of these issues might still exist. Slowing down won't help, if there's a fundamental lack of quality assurance at each stage. So applying it specifically just to the speed in this case is erroneous. It becomes fundamentally endemic to the structure rather than the speed. The speed just simply highlights it a lot sooner. Now let's cover the benchmarking process and some of the caveats of each of these models. So on data collection, one of the key items in producing a review is benchmark data. Not every media outlet does this, as I mentioned before, but when showcasing the technical aspects of a product, it's usually a good idea. The historic small team mentality of benchmark data is by having a unified testing protocol, then running through the tests one by one over the course of those two to 24 or 48 hours and collecting the data. If the writer is the one doing the benchmarking, then they will usually have a good idea of what works and what doesn't, simply through experience. They say you've never truly been a benchmarker until you've seen the GTA 5 benchmark at least 5,000 times. For larger teams, this gets a little disjointed depending on the product. For a generic mid-cycle review, chances are that the benchmarking team has a set process which is followed and the data gets passed onto the script writer. For something more important like a launch and potentially ahead of time, the script writer is assumed to know all the new technologies and to work with the benchmarkers to build tests that push any new particular element. On a larger scale, testing for the regular suite is often automated. Now here's where we get into automation versus just running tests one by one or solo running versus a unified testing protocol. And each person has their own thoughts here. It usually comes down to a small team versus large team mindset. Almost every tech reviewer I know started solo running tests. It's easy to do. Very few develop the tools to go automated because there are a lot of caveats of doing it that way and aside from simply having the knowledge to do so. Others simply swear off automated testing completely simply because of the caveats. But I would like to point out here that the big organizations that we talk about day in, day out, all use automated testing, whether that's benchmarks, code, anything, unless it's super, super new. The LMG model was based on individual solo run testing for a long, long time. The solution to that as they scaled was expected to be the labs, which despite the first video being about it on November, 2021, Actually, for all intents and purposes, it's only really been alive for a year, and it's designed down that automation route. The automation process, while well, the idea of being consistent, isn't typically a fast implementation. You have to develop scripts, test edge cases, manage ass backward game developers who can't make anything easy when then update it week to week to break it. For my first test automation suite for my CPU suite it took several months to get the code working semi-consistently in a framework that made it easier to add new tests. And month to month, there would still be updates to that script, either to fix issues, add features, or to simply deal with the fact that CPU testing and engineering sample might have a bad ASCII character in the name breaking everything. The GPU scripting is worse, although when you have a good framework in place, it isn't that difficult to get consistency. The problem here is that each game is different, and this is where being adaptable comes in because any update can cause a script breaking bug. Assuming you've got around the fact that the game might think you're botting with an automated script, because that is always an issue. 
and it all sucks. Ultimately, an automated suite is a living thing. It's a constant prototype because there will always be one issue you haven't come across. For example, there was one game I was adding to my suite, but while it was working on my test system, it wouldn't work on some of my other test beds. It was random, or so I thought. Turns out that the game was having a hissy fit for the settings file based simply on the monitor and the type of connection, you know, DisplayPort versus HDMI, and it took a whole week to find that one issue. But when it worked, it was smooth sailing for testing. That's assuming nothing else cropped up, like a Windows update. Linus Media Group's labs is currently in flux right now. They're still transitioning from solo testing to automation, and their goals for automation are astronomic, with AI-enhanced on-screen recognition for when random splash screens occur, and more detailed logic for retesting if out of the five runs aren't within a standard given deviation. All the logic a solo runner benchmarker would do on the fly has to be integrated. A lot of people have said about this, well then wait until the script is ready. But as I stated before, this is more like a living and breathing prototype, like a Formula 1 car, where you have to fix and go because it will never be 100% ready and 100% perfect. This brings about some issues if you don't have a system in place for someone technical to analyze the data before it goes to filming. If the person building the graphs isn't technical, or the video isn't technical, or the host just doesn't know about that particular product directly, then they'll all miss any glaring issue. They're also relying on the video editor to use the updated correct graph when an issue is spotted, which has been some of the reason for bad data, according to Linus Media Group in their latest video. One other factor here about automating testing is that more often than not, you only spot issues after running a test a thousand times. The nature of automation is that you let it run and examine all the data at the end, or if you're clever, you can examine the data as it comes in, if you have time. Solo runners can catch individual issues immediately, but solo running doesn't scale when you start doing diverse projects and needing multiple reviewers. On the spending extra time to take more data, again, this is about process. Most tech media and organizations, especially YouTube, are small independent outfits, anywhere from one to eight people, all working in close proximity, potentially with overlapping roles. If there's an immediate issue, you literally just shout across the room to the person that matters. In a large publisher or organization, you revolve around teams that do similar stuff. As I said, writers are in a team, testing is in a team, filming is a team, editing is a team, publishing is a team. They don't work in the same area, so communication might be managed above the individual workers' heads. I can imagine a film editor just being given a bunch of video files, results, and a script and told, edit, with no previous input to what their video is about. The only person in that chain with any understanding on what the data should look like might be the benchmarker or the script writer. The script writer may not have even tested or held the product themselves because it's in a different building or different continent. The commentary about not catching errors in time is likely due to the fact that once you go beyond the writer, the chain isn't PC technical anymore most of the time. The host of the video might be technical, but they're relying on the accuracy of the writer and the test data. They're not going to go double check it themselves unless something obvious is, is there or it's pointed out. There are likely plenty of issues that crop up that do get fixed. We only see the ones that make it live. Based on my history, I've likely got errors in every one of my 10 years of reviews. I'm not perfect. I've made some historic fuck ups in my time, most of which I was able to po uh, fix post publication, but they still all come through. So on the comment about reshooting and the time and effort it takes to reshoot an erroneous part of a video. So if a video has gone to the point where it's been tested, written, filmed, and then perhaps edited, and a mistake is found, there are multiple options here. Egregious fundamental errors, such as leaving the plastic on a CPU cooler, should ensure that a video is restarted, ground up. Based on the latest Linus Media Group video with Terran at the helm, this is going to be the standard. Less fundamental errors can either be removed from the script, such as a cyberpunk benchmark clearly being wrong, you can just leave it out, or you can retest, reshoot, and then re-edit. This is assuming the error is even caught, given what I've said above about chains of people not being technical. This also assumes that even if the corrected graph is provided to the video team, that the team actually uses it. If an error gets caught, then yes, posting data isn't a good thing. However, the decision to retest, refilm has its own issues. Linus is correct in saying that retesting and refilming could be $500 plus in people's time. But beyond that, unless it's something that can be done there and then, it has to fit into schedule. Book time in the studio, ensure that everyone is available. 
There's also to ensure consistency with looks, hair, makeup. You could end up doing it several days later. If recording a video, a full video is typically a five hour job, including two and a half hours for, for film crew to set up and dare down, then a two minute re-record is actually a minimum two and a half hours. And it might not be possible until Thursday when everyone in that process has a time slot. As you add more quality assurance, that gets worse. Then you've also lost a video for that day. And so the real cost isn't just the $500, but the revenue lost for not maintaining schedule. It's up to what would be an editor in chief as to whether the schedule should be dinged or not. Although a smaller team is often more flexible with content and the larger organizations are not. Journalists since the start of time has always had to work for deadlines. Those that don't meet them usually end up getting fired. However, posting something that's really wrong should be caught by an editor in chief, something that Linus Media Group doesn't have. Lots of people think that everyone is a small organization operation and can do things on a dime. If you have a corporate process and with sufficient quality assurance, ideally you'd have a backlog of content ready to go to fill in those gaps. But logistically, managing different teams is why, is why middle management exists. And there's a question as to who you put in those roles. Steve points out that this is an ownership mindset and he's right. The owner has to keep the wheels turning and they make judgment calls. This owner, Linus, happens to be the one in front of the camera. The owner is emotional towards the company. In reality, for a team of uh, Linus Media Group's size, it shouldn't be the arbiter of where time should be spent on content. There are times where people like this will make these calls, if the person in the chain has the authority to do so. I don't know any engineer who wouldn't mind more time. But for the comment about simply just retake the two sentences in a video to mitigate the asterisks, again, for a small team, let's just hop in the studio and record. For large teams, there's a process to it, and it's not as simple as a lot of people make it out to be. Perhaps it can be different in, if you can hide it in B-roll, but not always. There was a full segment where Steve talks about asterisks in videos, for example, which I don't think most have an issue with. But there are two specific problems that Steve brings up. The first is uh, one specific example of the need for two corrections in a five minute video on basic specifications. He'd assume that Linus Media Group should know. Again, I'll point out here, not everyone at LMG is an expert or even invested in technology. So there is that, not everyone's gonna see every issue every time. And I don't think this is actually a super serious issue. Yes, people hearing it might not see the correction on screen, but I don't know anyone who is writing down specifications from a Linus Tech Tips video and using that as a reason to buy a product for writing down, uh, for making note of specifications. Yes, these specifications should be correct, but it's not as serious as it comes across. The second asterisk point is to cover up more serious errors, such as one example where a keyboard not having stickers, even though Linus said it did. In this specific example, it looks like Linus was speaking off script and simply misidentified the product but maybe I'm wrong. As long as an asterisk isn't the serious reason for the final conclusion, I'm okay with them. Even ones as serious as the keyboard stickers, or not in this case. Number of times I've done minor edits in my content after filming or posting, number of times anyone has done, has done it shouldn't be held hostage. At what point though, Steve highlights that a video used an asterisk to showcase the teraflops of the A100 machine learning hardware was wrong. When in actual fact, I should point out the host was right and the video editor was wrong. The teraflops on screen was right for floating 0.16 dense performance, which is standard, but it was corrected in post to read for the floating 0.16 sparse number, which seems like that it was only corrected arbitrarily because only a few things in machine learning use that level of sparsity. This specific example was used for the just take the host back down to the studio comment. Gamers Nexus doesn't cover machine learning, so there is that, but it makes me wonder while pointing out these asterisks if Gamers Nexus actually fact-checked whether they were indeed accurate themselves. Steve also points out here that some of these errors only take five minutes to correct. I hope I've taken you through here why that is not the case. It is for a small team operation, which he's very much used to, but when you have a large organization, that is just not the case. In the asterisk section, Steve also takes a jibe at a host on an LTT sponsored video for remarking that there's a backplate. Steve exclaims that the host praised the company for gracing us with a $1 backplate. This, this comes off as a very pithy comment in my opinion, and just making a gripe at a sponsor video. Steve's views on sponsors is well known, but I guess I expected more continuity in that specific argument, it just felt really weird and out of place. So we move on to accuracy, ethics and responsibility. In this segment, Steve highlights that, we've been see that they've seen 
an alarming amount of conflicts from Linus Tech Tips as it relates to their conflicts of interest given corporate connections, the flow of money, and the potential bias as a result. In that sentence, he's actually doing something really amazing. He presents a conclusion that there are conflicts in the first part, but then backtracks in the second half of the sentence by stating potential bias. This is a common rhetoric and English language tactic to make the person reading or listening believe something before you've been provided evidence. You've already calling them conflicts as a hard and fast fact, but then immediately backtrack to the words potential bias. This is an incredibly sneaky way of wording things. Judging by my Twitter feed, a lot of people looked over this and other sentences like it. Steve highlights that Linus is personally invested into framework and showcases their hardware, but the media group still reviews laptops. Now, every framework video I've seen, or even casual mention on Linus's live streams, he states unequivocally that he is an investor. He's still allowed to do videos, to do testing, and it's on the audience to believe those results are genuine or not, as the case may be. That whether he's doing a review, or more likely a showcase, which is like a review, but usually a significant lighter touch, not designed for buying suggestions, it's for other vendors to decide whether to send laptops to Linus Media Group. And chances are, those devices were acquired all these devices for review are acquired without Linus ever being in that email chain. I think the people with the biggest gripe, if there is some level of impropriety here, would actually be the laptop manufacturers themselves, but Steve doesn't address this. We then come on to the Noctua branded LTT screwdriver, which again, in all honesty, is less likely to have Linus involved at any stage. It gets to a point where here people start to think that someone in Linus' position is on every single email, making every single decision. Linus has stated, whether you believe him or not, although Gamers Nexus frequently brings up clips of Linus talking, addressing his points, so I assume they do, that he, it, that he, if ever, knows who is advertising at Linus Media Group or not. The sales is separate from the people writing the reviews, or the benchmarkers, or the film crew, and usually the host. That's why most sponsor spots on LTT are segues, and a different person is doing the ad, ad read. The wall of separation between the company and the one making the opinion is well established in mantra in the media from top to tail. It's harder to police with smaller teams and smaller companies, in fact. Steve also makes a dig at the hiring of industry veterans, like the new CEO Terran and head of labs Gary, like I mentioned before. I find it somewhat unbelievable that Steve would honestly think that Linus Media Group, or Linus personally, doesn't already have relationships at this point with the, com with the companies of one of the, their ex-employees. The value people like that bring to the job is the experience, very rarely the connections, especially given what they used to do. Do you really think Gary, as head of labs, is making connections for ASUS to sponsor events that Linus Media Group didn't already have those connections? Do you really think that Terran, as new CEO, is making inroads to Corsair to make sponsorships that Linus Media Group didn't have already? Again, this comes across as a very pithy remark that is baseless in its accusatory tone. In the next segment, Steve starts to discuss the implicit ethics of knowing a lack of qualifications yet continuing to operate on a certain type of content. I'm not too sure what implicit ethics are, but let's address the topic of qualifications. To be a hardware reviewer, I'll simply state that you don't need any. Number of people in the industry that do great work but have little more than a high school diploma or nothing at all is amazing. All different sorts of content all different overviews, some are technical, some are not, and many of them are extremely passionate. But everyone draws a line, or you could potentially call it gatekeeping, as to how much knowledge you have in order to publish technical data. Everyone has a boundary, and you'll find the most self-assured, confident creators have the highest bar for that. Having worked my way through, doing my 10 years in the minds of written content and research, I'd argue that when I started, I had a technical background, but really, I was an idiot. By plenty of measures, I'm still an idiot today. I'm still learning. I still make mistakes. The key here is not qualifications, it's experience, or having a sufficient mentor and quality assurance chain to make sure everything is corrected. Qualifications help, sure, but they're not the be-all and end-all. Before somebody points out that the sentence I'm quoting is out of context or shortened, the full sentence from Steve is, the implicit ethics of knowing, a lack of qualifications yet contributing to operate on a certain type of content, or being unwilling to commit the time to do the content properly, especially if you know that there are flaws and shortcomings already and choose to forge ahead. There are multiple points here to unpack, 
But Steve boils the errors in Lights Media Group's production to one of two caveats. One, that the schedule is rushed, or two, the team is unqualified. In this instance, Steve doesn't state which one he thinks it is, or that it could be both, but he doesn't leave the door open for any other potentials, such as growth pains, mismanagement, the flux of labs versus solo testing, or the lack of proper quality assurance. I'm not defending Linus Media Group here. There are things they absolutely have to do better, and that's also why there's now a new CEO in charge. I have actually spoken with the new CEO, Taron Tong, and it was telling. I asked him if he was putting a pl plan together, a 12-month plan together for the company, and he simply stated, let's start with the first three months. Then we move over to another review that has issues, the Ponage Stormbreaker mouse. Steve describes what is an 11 minute video about a mouse on the short circuit channel. This channel is usually reserved for unboxings and first impressions. In a video posted in the last week since we're filming this, the host fails to notice that there were plastic covers on the feet and dings the mouse negatively because of the high friction it has. At the end of the video, he says, I wouldn't buy it. Normally, from an unboxing video, I wouldn't want this sort of thing. So one could argue that this video is a review and not an unboxing. So the Linus Media Group team, and note the team, not Linus specifically, stated that they would edit the video directly in YouTube, take it out, which can take up to 48 hours while the old video is shown. They also stated the manufacturer didn't make it obvious and provided little instructions to remove these little plastic feet. In the Gamers Nexus video, Steve highlights this as an endemic part of the Linus Media Group review process. Something is wrong, blame the manufacturer, don't bother reshooting the video. As other people on social media have pointed out, the mouse has also a lot of other flaws which could push to the conclusion that they gave, not just the feet. And Steve fails to highlight this directly, except in a short community snippet three minutes later in the video. Steve states that if the marketing point, main marketing point of the mouse is a low friction, it has to be tested. Thing is, in that host's mind, they did test it. Steve is dinging them simply here for not knowing. There's a ton of stuff I don't know. There's a ton of stuff Linus doesn't know. There's a ton of stuff Steve doesn't know. But Steve also highlights that while missing the plastic covers might be acceptable for an end user, it wouldn't be for a seasoned reviewer. This is somewhat fair, although are you sure that the host here is a reviewer and not just simply an unboxer? This falls down the rabbit hole of experience and competence, which I'll get to in a bit. But Steve calls this a magnitude of error disingenuous to the viewership, again, without highlighting any of the rest of the unboxing. It is an 11 minute video. So this is truly, really mountains out of molehills. Steve goes on to say that not removing this tape is egregious. However, Steve says it in the way that assumes the unboxer knew it was there. That's the whole point. They didn't. You can't add knowledge into someone's brain before the fact. Seem Steve seems to think here that the lack of noticing something is as big a disservice as shitting on the product and claims that this is simply a function of not having enough time with the product. Ponage in their tweet addresses the fact that it isn't Linus doing it and it should have been verified before publication. This is a good argument here for a new test, a new video, something which given time from publishing to the Gamers Nexus video, it would have been rushed if it was up already today as I'm filming this. However, given the Linus Media Group initial response, you could tell that wasn't going to happen. There in line lies the bigger issue of creative control, and that's the point that Steve should have focused on here, as we've covered already. Whether or not you take Gamers Nexus or Linus Media Group's side in this, I do want to mention a story here. Now, as a hardware reviewer, I've built tons of systems. On a testbed, off a testbed, over a thousand, maybe five thousand systems. There was one review, a big high-end uh, ripper type platform, where I got the hardware in for, for a launch day review. So I rushed it, obviously and I ran in all my automated scripts and started to write the review. As a one-man team, I saw the data when it came time to analyze and I found a big error. Ultimately, I discovered that I had left the plastic wrap on the bottom of the liquid cooler. That obviously caused a lot of four-letter words at the time. And with the time I had left together, I scraped together a review with proper testing. I even made a page to showcase the differences if you make this error. The point being, even with somebody of my experience, not the most experienced in the industry, but there's some. Shit happens. I caught it before the video went live, but it would have affected my opinion. So there are many of these issues that we as reviewers catch that you simply never know about. And I'm serious. It's only the mistakes you notice. I think it's somewhat a bit nitpicky because it leads into some of Steve's comments about editing and replacing videos. Now I'll put this here because as a former written journalist, our opportunity to change an article after the fact is immense. Change a word, 
change your number, it happens all the time. It's also why I'm not too fussed about the asterisk changes for a specification missed. Every so often, there is a mea culpa where something just went wrong. A full article or a full video needs to be updated. In the written world, normally we'd add commentary to the top of that effect, but still keep the article up and then replace as needed with a footnote. With video, it's very difficult. YouTube's tools are awful. You can't add additional commentary after you post a video. You can't change audio. All you can do is cut a section out. And as, as I've said before, that can take 24 to 48 hours. Now you can pin a comment or change the description to mention the highlight where it cuts. Steve highlights a feature that Linus Media Group has access to that most other creators do not. The ability to change a full video in or out. In the written world, this is a staple. This is a given. Steve's argument here is that without taking down the content immediately and either publishing new or editing the going public, millions of people will see an erroneous set of testing. Thing is, we have precedence for this. Errors in newspapers never get corrected, or corrections are on page 12 at the bottom corner of the next day. The edits Linus Media Group is able to do is within the scope of the system, and unless the system changes, I've got no issues with that as long as the other stuff is done as well. Dig in the fact that Linus Media Group has a feature Gamers Nexus has does not comes across as jealous if i'm honest now i'm jealous too and i recognize why it's a limited feature that they might even have to email youtube directly to get it done and that also takes time the last section is an unfair to all section and in the final segment of the video steve states that linus media group's actions undermines all tech reviewers he specifically states it's sad to see and it undermines all of us steve is taking it upon himself here to speak for the whole of the tech review community to which I will politely decline. It does take some ego to do that. I'll grant him that. Although whether it undermines tech reviewers, I'd argue the complete opposite here. If the audience can see just how much misinformation is coming through, then the content creator is going to see it reflected in the numbers. If someone else is wrong, then it's your duty to do it right, especially when it comes to testing and to accuracy. It's all very well highlighting the inaccuracy of others, but that really does come across as punching down and not an honest attempt to actually affect some change in the industry or a standards change. In the written space, there is a wealth of information from the completely untechnical, no benchmark strategy of wishy-washy content to the super technical side of the spectrum. Are there a few that slide up and down the scale? Sure. Do I feel aggrieved that a big entity is shirking the accuracy? Perhaps. But I see it as an opportunity as an individual to provide more. As Steve from Hardware Unbox says, let your work do the talking. Now, Steve from Gamers Nexus then opined that on, the algorithm doesn't need to be fed every day like Linus Media Group uploads every day. This is true. However, most of uh, Linus Media Group's channels don't upload every day. It, it is my understanding that it depends what you build your brand around. If you only post once a week, that's what the algorithm learns about you. If you post every day, then that as well, along with the associated metrics, in order to find ways to promote your content, content more, if wanted. To simply issue a blanket statement is oversimplifying the matter, if I'm honest. Steve then states, it's getting difficult for those of us trying to do things right, and we're not the only ones in the tech media to weigh into a product conversation after Linus Tech Tips, where we have to tiptoe around it to kind of try and subtly correct it. Now, I don't get this phrase, if I'm honest. One outlet's content should not be liable or beholden to another. If someone has to, it has put false information out there, get it right in your content. Why tiptoe around it? Save LMG's feelings? It's difficult to see what side of the fence Steve is on here. The whole point of the media, written or video, is that we don't all move at the same beat of the same drum. If the loud guy is offbeat, then make sure you're correct in what you do. There is no need to tiptoe. You now say you don't care anymore, but why did you even care in the first place? The next section is about the CEO and having responsibility for what you say. 100%. I'd say this applies directly to an individual. Number of times other people have taken careless words of one individual and applied it to a huge company is absurd. A company is not a single person, even if your name is splashed over the front. Steve's conclusion, which he doesn't preface by saying, I conclude, but states it as he has other facts, which again is an obfuscation of the difference between fact and opinion. Steve's conclusion is that LMG is acting in a careless, irresponsible way with bad data points in conclusion, either through laziness and unwillingness to commit the time, cheapness, whatever is focused on the bottom line, all of these things, these irresponsible actions, they can affect, in the worst case, the life of work of an individual or a company, or in more common cases, it can just mislead consumers spending money they don't have to spend on things that they don't realize 
may or may not be the right fit for them. The big thing about this long wind on sentence is the direct link, causal link to proof. It's all very well to have correlation in your beliefs, but if you're presenting it as fact, we need to see numbers. To anyone that's going to say, but it is obvious, to me, I challenge you to offer that level of evidence in many other situations. Steve does a good job here of attempting to state thoughts as fact. Now, he may very well be right, but all he's doing here is extrapolating a series of bad events and not connecting them to any direct sales. You might argue that he would never get access to that data, but he's still drawing a conclusion here. He explicitly states earlier about the purchasing decisions of millions of people, but fails to showcase one specific sale. This point is quickly brushed under the rug into the next sentence. The point about ruining a company is also worthy of note here. Steve states that he was in contact at the time of the video with Billet, and, but since the video, Billet has confirmed the state of affairs. They'll be getting compensation for the prototype, they don't want it back, and they're pressing ahead with business. While Billet, yes, is a monumental screw-up, the company isn't ruined in this instance, or at least by my definition. Steve doesn't point to a second example in the video. Next point is the correlation with sponsors and being light on them. I've covered this earlier in this video regarding ASUS and Framework, and I don't need to go over those points again. As far as I can tell, based on how Linus Media Group works, this is all a big red herring. You can still cite skepticism, but Steve offers no direct evidence here. Steve could argue, and does, that Linus Media Group doesn't go hard on Company X because of a sponsorship. From a 30,000 foot point of view, this is Steve applying his own standards on coverage externally to him. Sometimes the big news organizations don't take a story. At Anantech, I was told several times over the years not to cover certain topics. Each outlet is allowed to focus on what they want and focus on what they think is more important. Perhaps the more pressing question Steve should be asking is whether LMG did LMG not think it was important enough to cover. That's a more honest question without drawing unfounded conclusions about sponsorship. Steve states that these situations raise concerns about Linus Media Group's objectives as a company, also citing the funny or goofy elements alongside some bad data. It's not okay, says Steve, making it sound like he's also objecting to the funny and goofy side. Everyone has lines, and Steve would appear to believe that LMG crosses his. He's entitled to his opinion here. Steve also goes on to say that the data matters, the consumer matters, the truth matters. And if you've known anything about modern media in the last 10 years, each brand has a different scale on which each of those points apply. Again, Steve is judging Linus Media Group by his own stick in what is a spectrum. Another comment here worth highlighting, if you start marketing your business on accuracy and data and objectivity, like those of us who have occupied the space since the website days, then we should all be held to the same standards. We should all play by the same rules. I find this somewhat gatekeeping because no, the rules don't have to be the same. Arguably, they've never been the same. If your lineup is purely engineers and you go down that route, then that's what you will be judged on. If you go down the entertainment route and have a handful of benchmarks, that's what you'll be judged on. If there's a mismatch here, you'll find the audience will align very quickly. Now, since Steve has put this video out, Linus Media Group and the new CEO have stated a video about a number of measures they're looking into in order to improve data accuracy. In some circumstances, it's, testing, it's a testing quality assurance issue. In others, it was the video editors not using the updated graphs where errors were spotted. The new CEO also laid out a new procedure for erroneous content where it comes to corrections after posting or retesting and missing deadlines. Details apparently will be disclosed later. I will say, as an overall comment, Steve's position seems to flip-flop between pro-company and anti-company. At times he will defend the smaller company to the hilt and then rail on someone bigger. It's because he's pitting these companies to different standards. Everyone enjoys an underdog story. Although the framing of the nature of those arguments often leaves me wanting more of a reasoning behind any particular direction. But hey, maybe that's just me. With that, I've covered a lot. Not sure how long this video will be, but if you stayed this far, thank you. I know a lot of you will consider my commentary here in certain parts to be overly specific, but please bear in mind that we've covered a lot of topics today, and I know some of you see things like the Bidlet Labs as the most important, the Madison story the most important, or the benchmarking as the most important. There's a focus here for everyone, and not everyone thinks the same, hence why I wanted to cover all these different areas in this level of detail. The level of detail I think is important to understand from my personal perspective. This is not a story that ends today, by any stretch with what's happening at Linus Media Group, and it will take time to solve there or time to do anything else. And I know a fraction of you will want Linus to just simply disappear. The question is, will Gabe and Nexus cover it, or will we cover it? I guess we'll have to wait and see. One final note, I have reached out to LMG about an interview with the new CEO, Taryn. 
I have a tentative yes, although it's unlikely to be in any short time, as you probably understand. I'm actually on a road trip for the next while, but I'll loop back with them when I get home.